Here's what you've missed and what's coming up on Conspiracy in Canton. Officer John O'Keefe was found dead in Canton in January of 2022. Outside a home currently occupied by people known to O'Keefe. He was transported to the Good Samaritan Medical Center where he was pronounced dead. State prosecutors accuse Karen Reed, who was O'Keefe's girlfriend, of backing into him and leaving him to die in the snow. Reed's attorney says she tried to call O'Keefe and had no idea anything had happened to him. I think it's a terrible accident. It seems logical that police would have looked at Karen Reed as a possible suspect. One of her taillights had fresh damage. She openly questioned if she hit John O'Keefe and prosecutors say she left him a voicemail that night saying she hated him. I will tell you that my client has no criminal intent. She loved this man. They just seem to be in a happy place, you know. Reed pleaded not guilty to manslaughter, motor vehicle homicide and leaving the scene of a crash causing death. An investigation into the death of a Boston police officer in Canton has taken a turn. Lawyers for the woman under arrest not only say their client is innocent, but they're alleging a cover-up. They say there were a lot of people at the home that night, and one of them Googled how long to die in the cold hours before Reed would have known O'Keefe was missing. The lead detective is very close with the owners of that property. Prosecutors point to pieces of a broken taillight as evidence, but her lawyers argue the police report was altered. First got to that scene at 6 a.m. and did not find a single piece of taillight, and then 12 hours later, boom, they found taillight everywhere. Reed's parents and thousands supporting her say there's so much more to this story that doesn't add up. This is not a Hollywood star, this is an accused murderer getting a standing ovation as she enters the courtroom. What is going on out there? So listen up, sir. And I'll speak slowly so you understand. My <laughs> mercy, we ain't got no quit. The first five episodes of Conspiracy in Canton were released consecutively mostly about a week apart. I had to take a little break for a while to deal with some health issues, but I have been receiving all of your emails, messages of support and encouragement, and also the DMs that were flat out begging for the next episode. I know I kept you waiting longer than you'd like, but 13th Juror Podcast is back with Conspiracy in Canton, Episode 6. If you're keeping up with this case in real time, you know that there continues to be new developments, court filings, arguments, and the bitter debate between sides doesn't seem to be easing anytime soon. While all of these are issues that need to be addressed and discussed, I want to stick right now with examining the investigation, the evidence, and the details in a linear fashion. When we left off, we were comparing the theories of the prosecution and the defense as they have been presented so far and seeing which theories align with what evidence. Now, this has been problematic because there are so many inconsistencies in the evidence presented as well as the statements given. There are also glaring issues with the investigation that was conducted, which has impacted our ability to know if these inconsistencies are from the witnesses or from law enforcement or both. Now, I mentioned in the last episode that some of the most reliable evidence used in trials today is collected from digital footprints cell phone records, video surveillance, health data, even smartwatches can provide critical information to help authorities piece together the events surrounding an unsolved crime. Obviously, the most crucial minutes in the case are those 15 or so minutes that Karen Reed was outside of 34 Fairview Road. And we talked about those minutes in the last episode. But that's not the only time period that's up for debate. The activities of Karen, the McCabe's, the Alberts, and the law enforcement officers involved in this investigation have all been hot-button topics among the court filings from the defense and the prosecution, and they've set social media on fire. I mentioned before that there are two types of data that we can rely on in trials. One is what I call the anchor data, where it's very clear, precise, reliable, and there's no room for interpretation. Everything is black and white. Then there's the data that isn't quite as clear. These are the reports where we often rely on experts to convey their interpretation to a jury, or it could be the data that has an allowable margin of variation. 
For example, if a cell phone pings on a specific tower, that information can give you a general area of where the phone is located, but not a precise location. Now, that allowable margin of variation has been at the center of the dispute on what happened that night and early morning when Officer John O'Keefe tragically lost his life. I want to work our way through the rest of the timeline and what we know about it. I have to admit, it gets pretty complicated, especially because of all the inconsistencies. So, instead of the regular episode guides with only pictures, charts, and graphs, I've also created an interactive timeline where you can see everything laid out together. You can scroll through to see how the anchor data that we mentioned compares to the statements, and I've also included the conflicts and the issues of each time noted. You can follow along with this episode or check it out later on 13thjurorpodcast.com. We've talked about the theories from both the prosecution and the defense about what happened at 34 Fairview Road. Both sides have presented theories based on evidence, and we were able to poke holes in both of those theories. So what other information do we have to work with that could help paint a clearer picture of what happened in those early morning hours? Let's start with Karen leaving the Alberts house. The exact time that she left is unknown, but in a pretrial hearing in May of 2023, Karen's defense attorney, David Yanetti, references a voicemail that Karen left on John's phone at 12.41 a.m. John lived at One Meadows Avenue in Canton. It's about two and a half miles from 34 Fairview. According to the defense, in the background of this voicemail, you can hear the garage door closing, the car door closing, and the house door closing, as well as the sound of Karen's heels on the garage floor. Google Maps estimates this drive to be about five to six minutes. However, we do know that by this time, snow was falling and it was dark outside, so the actual time may have been a couple minutes longer. This would mean that Karen would have left the Alberts more than likely no later than 1234. It's not surprising that this time is also contradicted since pretty much every piece of evidence has some sort of discrepancy, but in her January 29th interview, Jen McCabe says that she texted John hello at 1245 and then observed Karen's SUV driving away. Now, obviously, this is four minutes after Karen had already arrived and was inside the home at One Meadows. This version of events is also listed on the probable cause affidavit as well as the statement of case. However, we should note that Jen's story did change multiple times according to the reports. So what other data do we have for this trip home? Video surveillance from Canton Public Library captured Karen's car at 12.15 a.m. after leaving Waterfall Bar and Grill on the way to 34 Fairview. The library is about a mile from John's house, and if you take into consideration the direction that Karen was facing when she left and where she was going, the most likely route that she would have taken home is almost a direct shot that would take her right by the library again. Yanetti says that this piece of evidence is enough to exonerate his client because the footage will show as she passes that her rear taillight is still intact. And if her rear taillight is still intact, that means that she didn't shatter it by backing into John. Seems simple enough, right? But nothing in this case is that simple. Here's David Yanetti speaking during that May hearing. We know the video equipment was working because they have that footage from 12:16 a.m. But in the video that the prosecution turned over to us, there is a gap in that video from 12:37 a.m. to 12:39 a.m., which would have been the precise time my client would have been driving back past the library. We know that that footage would show that my client's taillight was still intact at that point because she never struck John O'Keefe with her vehicle. Yet the prosecution has produced a video from the library with that crucial time period missing. This is strictly in their possession. We've been told that the Canton police provided the evidence to them via a share file, I'm sorry, the Canton library <coughs> provided this evidence to them via a share file link with a guest I, uh, ID and a guest password. We need that link, that user ID and that password. We cannot rely on trooper Michael Proctor conflicted Michael Proctor to sanitize exculpatory evidence before sending it to us. We need the original footage. If the Commonwealth answers that that original footage no longer exists, then we'll need an evidentiary hearing to put the relevant parties under oath to find out what happened to it. 
This was a big moment. The courtroom during this hearing is packed, standing room only, and all eyes are on Yanetti as we hear that crucial camera footage is missing, and it could potentially be because of the prosecution, the lead investigator, or both. Assistant District Attorney Adam Lally responds. The video was uh, provided by the IT director for the town of Canton. Uh, there was a uh, share file that was shared with the troopers. Uh, the troopers, upon uh, receiving that, it was uh, Trooper Dunn who uh, received that video, not Trooper Proctor. Now, as far as the video was provided to Trooper Matthew Dunn uh, of the CPAC unit with the district attorney's office, that was then shared with Ms. Crawford. Uh, it was a, a person in our office who uh, specifically uh, who deals with uh, forensic and uh, surveillance video and type uh, evidence. It was then archived on our system. Uh, recently, uh, we reached out and spoke to the IT director with the town of Canton again. That share link I tried uh, to send uh, to council. Uh, email essentially wouldn't go through. We tried to open it. Uh, essentially, it won't open. Uh, so the link expired within 30 days, of, uh, within 60 days, if not 30 days, of it being shared with our office. But the exact information that was provided by the town of Canton was archived uh, by Ms. Crawford, was then provided to council uh, at her arraignment in Superior Court, uh, as well as I. Uh, was able to download it onto a Citrix file, which I then shared with counsel uh, earlier this week. Uh, so what we have is a video, what exists is a video. What we were given as a video for those relevant time frames was placed onto the, onto the uh, archive within our system, was then placed onto a disk, and what's on the disk, what's been provided to counsel, is what we received. Lally also addresses what Yanetti referred to as a conflict with Trooper Proctor here, but we'll be addressing that in a future episode. So, once again, we have very conflicting versions presented to the court here. Are those two crucial minutes missing from the Canton Library video because of a cover-up, like the defense suggests? Or was everything turned over exactly as it was received? Also, even though that route is the shortest for time and for distance, it isn't the only route that Karen could have taken back to John's that night. The maps are available on 13thjurorpodcast.com, but I'll try to help you visualize if you're unable to see them right now. The Alberts' house is northwest of John's house. Karen was driving south when she left, which would have brought her to Chapman Street. From Chapman, there are three main routes that she could have taken. Sherman Street, Washington to Sherman Street, or Pleasant Street. The Canton Library is located at the intersection of Sherman and Washington, so if she took either of those two routes home, she would have passed by the library around the time that Yanetti said that the footage was missing. The third possible route would be Pleasant Street. Now, this is the only route where she wouldn't have passed the Canton Library. According to the statement of case, police were canvassing for footage and did collect video from multiple locations along this route, though there are no sightings of her SUV in this footage mentioned in any of the documents or by the prosecution. It also seems highly unlikely that the defense attorneys would be demanding footage that they say shows their client if they've already seen footage that she took a different route home. This missing footage right now remains one of the unanswered questions. So what about other camera footage? According to the prosecution, John O'Keefe had multiple cameras set up in his ring surveillance system, including one by the front door and one over the garage. While the system reportedly registered 15 events during the time period of 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., there is no footage recorded of Karen arriving to One Meadows Avenue after dropping John off, although there is footage of her leaving the next morning. So what happened to that footage? How is it missing too? This is another piece of evidence that nobody seems to agree on. Let's look at it logically. Who had access to the ring system to delete the footage? Did Karen? Investigators asked John's niece and nephew about this, and they thought that Karen may have access to it through the home computer, though the computer was not searched to see if it was done. The other issue with this theory is, why would she have deleted this? Pulling into the driveway and the garage the taillight would have been on the opposite side of the car facing away from the camera. So it doesn't really seem logical to delete this or hide this. 
especially since the video is left on the cameras that showed her pulling out of the driveway where you actually can see her taillight. If this were an attempt to hide damage, wouldn't that be the one that she hid? We know what time that she got home because her voicemail to John, so it also doesn't make sense to delete the videos to hide the time that she arrived. So who else could have done it? According to court documents, investigators actually accessed the Ring app on John O'Keefe's phone on January 31st. And it was at this time where they documented that there were 15 events recorded during that 12-hour period. The defense filed a motion to compel the production of the Ring videos from John O'Keefe's home, and the motion was allowed by the court on October 5th of 2022. It took the district attorney's office three months before they finally responded to the defense, at which point they said that they obtained a search warrant for the missing videos. When the search warrant was finally provided, however, it was dated January 26th, exactly three weeks after the DA's office told the defense that the warrant already existed. The following month, the district attorney's office provided an email dated February 10th from ring.com stating that the ring videos had been deleted from Dropbox after 90 days. To be clear, 90 days prior to that email was November 12th. So if the videos were delivered from ring by November 12th, why did the district attorney not share those with the defense per the court's order? And why did they not respond until January 5th, claiming that they had a warrant, but the warrant wasn't dated until three weeks later? When comparing evidence to each side's theory here, we know for a fact that investigators accessed John's Ring app. And we know that the DA's office had the videos sent from Ring that they didn't share. But we don't even know if Karen had a way to access them or not. At the time of this recording, the defense has yet to receive the missing ring videos. There are also currently no known videos that exist of the alleged hit and run or the time in question, though Karen's attorneys have filed a motion related to this. As it turns out, during the grand jury testimony, Brian Albert was not questioned by ADA Lally about this, but rather a juror actually brought it up, asking if there were security cameras. According to the transcripts, ADA Lally then interjected by asking Brian Albert what he received as a Christmas gift in reference to cameras. Brian says that he received some sort of camera, possibly a Nest camera system, but said that it had not been set up. Now, the major red flag here isn't necessarily that he had a camera system for over a month that wasn't set up. The major red flag here is that Lally knew about this, yet it was never disclosed to the defense. This resulted in the defense's motion to summons Google to see if there were any cameras set up or accounts opened in either of the homeowner's names prior to January 29th. It's worth noting here that there were also reports early on from the local CBS affiliate WBZ-TV that ring camera footage did exist. I-team sources say the two had been in a relationship and that investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera and then impounded her car. There are neighbors in the area who have ring or other cameras, including the chief deputy of police in Canton. But at the time of this recording, I have been unable to find any subpoenas for any of their footage. So although there are still a lot of questions remaining about Karen leaving and her drive back to John's, we do know that according to the voicemail, she arrived at 1241. And not long after this, Jen McCabe placed three more calls to John's phone. So moving along the timeline, we know that according to statements, Nicole Albert told investigators that all guests left her home by 1 a.m. We also know that, like most statements in this case, this is false. In his testimony to the grand jury, ATF agent Brian Higgins says that he left the Albert home around 1.30. Now, this is not odd, but what stood out about his statement is that he says that he didn't leave to go home at 1.30 a.m. after hanging and partying with his friends as a blizzard's moving in. Instead, he went to the Canton Police Department to do administrative work. It seems like an odd time for this, but with such limited information, we can't really speculate a whole lot. We will hear a lot more about Higgins in the future, specifically about his relationship with Karen Reed. 
We learned through court documents that there were 56 pages of text retrieved from Higgins' phone between him and Karen, and they were described as, quote, romantic in nature, end quote. There's also an incident that he told investigators about where he says two weeks before John's death, he went to John's house to watch a football game. After the game, Higgins says that Karen walked him out and allegedly kissed him. There were also texts recovered between Higgins and John since he was friends with both. Now, obviously, it sounds really shady to carry this on behind John's back, especially since he was considered a friend. It doesn't shine good light on Higgins or on Karen. This, quote, romantic entanglement, end quote, was discussed in a filing, and while it sparked rumors on social media about potential links to John O'Keefe's tragic death, it should be noted that court documents do say that Brian Higgins did voluntarily turn over his phone and has appeared to be fully cooperative with the federal investigation as well as the investigation into John's death. There was some early communication back and forth between Higgins and some others that we will get into shortly, but we haven't heard much from him or about him since not long after John's death. And locals that I've spoken to said that he hasn't really been around. In the most recent hearing, the defense confirms that Higgins has apparently kept his distance from the Alberts, at least mostly. In this clip from the March 20th hearing, defense attorney David Yanetti refers to transcripts from Higgins' testimony to the federal grand jury. Uh, with regard to this motion, Your Honor, uh, Brian Albert was served with a subpoena to testify before a federal grand jury, and he begins reaching out for Brian Higgins. Brian Higgins testified to the federal grand jury that he stopped taking Brian Albert's calls. He stopped replying to Brian Albert's text messages. It's fair to say that led to a panic in the Albert family. We learned that Brian Albert contacted his brother, Canton police officer Kevin Albert, to intervene. I'm actually going to stop you there for one second. The judge interrupts here to verify with ADA Lally that Kevin Albert is not a Commonwealth witness. They discuss homicide jurisdiction for state police and Canton police being conflicted out of the investigation, which would obviously include also Kevin Albert. Yanetti continues. So the Canton police had a conflict precisely because Kevin Albert is an officer in their department. So how can they conduct an investigation which includes the brother of one of their officers? It stands to reason they can't. They appeared to recognize that. Yet Chief Berkowitz is talking to witnesses in this case, and Kevin Albert himself inserted himself into this case. Brian Albert testified to the federal grand jury about the fact that after Brian Albert received a federal grand jury subpoena, Kevin Albert contacted Brian Higgins. Kevin Albert said to Higgins, and I quote, look, you went off the grid and Brian doesn't understand. You haven't called him, you haven't checked in on him since these subpoenas go out. Everyone got a subpoena, but you. Those were Kevin Albert's words to Brian Higgins. And Your Honor, there's only one way to interpret that. Brian Albert was panicked that Kevin, um, that, sorry, that Brian Higgins had flipped on him. Brian Albert enlists his Canton police officer brother to contact Higgins to try and find out if that was the case and it wasn't just text messages between them. After first testifying that he didn't want to talk to Kevin Albert about the investigation, Brian Higgins later admitted that before he testified before the federal grand jury on June 1st of 2023, Higgins and Kevin Albert talked on the phone for a good 15 minutes. That was two days before he testified before the federal grand jury. Before he testifies to the feds, Brian Higgins is conferring with Kevin Albert, who supposedly conflicted out of the case. So the entanglement with his friend's girlfriend and the timing of some of his conversations and a few discrepancies in grand jury testimony have definitely raised some eyebrows. But overall, most of what we've heard about Brian Higgins has been positive. His attorney, William Connolly, says that Higgins has spent his career saving lives, even receiving a Congressional Medal for saving the life of a fellow ATF agent. He was a firefighter and EMT before becoming an ATF agent, and he served in Iraq. Connolly goes on to say that covering up an alleged murder goes against the person that Higgins is. 
I'm sure that we will hear more at trial about his departure at 1.30, but when he left, we know that he says that he did not see John O'Keefe lying on the ground in the yard. So let's move on to Jen and Matt McCabe. According to Jen's phone location data, we know that she left her sister's home at about 1.47 a.m. Now, her statements all say that she left at 1.30, so a 17-minute discrepancy in this case isn't cause for too much concern. We also know that Sarah Levinson and Julie Nagel, who had been visiting Brian Albert Jr. for his birthday, were given rides home from Matt and Jen. Now, we've discussed the conflicting statements here before, one where Jen says that she and her husband went home, one where she mentions just taking Julie home, and the other where she mentions driving two of her nephew's friends home. Something to note here is that there is no mention anywhere of Sarah Levinson in any of the documents or interviews until months into the investigation. And getting the prosecution to give that information to the defense was kind of like pulling teeth. Even then, there is no interview done with her until October. This is no fault of her own. It's just one more issue to add to the ever-growing list of investigation missteps. The time and location data from Jen McCabe's phone suggests that she probably took Julie home first. Based on the estimated drive, this would have been sometime around 153, 155, somewhere in that area. Now, Jen's location data shows her on Lawrence and Leonard Streets about 10 minutes later, which is the area where Sarah lives, very close to John O'Keefe. From here, it's an estimated 9 or 10 minute drive home for the McCabes, which is consistent with them arriving back home around 2.12 a.m. It's now 2.15 a.m. The snow is falling, the blizzard is on the way, and a snowplow driver that goes by the name Lucky leaves the Canton Department of Public Works yard in his six-wheel international truck, heading out to plow the route that he's ran for the last three years, which includes Fairview Road. The next few minutes form what is arguably among the top three most debated series of events of this entire case. The other two being, of course, the time that Karen was at Fairview Road and the taillight search. Look, it's no secret that Karen's attorneys are presenting a third-party culpability defense, and a large part of their theory is based on some of the behaviors, the actions, the evidence, all related to what's going on during this specific time frame. The defense has given detailed theories about who is involved, what they believe happened, and they've highlighted the powerful connections that this family has to law enforcement and the community, which gives weight to the plausibility of this cover-up. They have also presented evidence and experts that back their defense. Up to this point, we've mostly pointed out the issues and inconsistencies in the evidence and especially in the investigation itself, taking note of what doesn't make sense, what was done wrong, asking questions, and comparing data and statements against both theories. We are now about to dive into the crux of the defense's theory, the evidence that they say implicates the witnesses, not just law enforcement. There's not a way for me to report on this case without presenting this information. However, I do want to be clear that just as Karen Reed is awarded the presumption of innocence, so are the parties involved in the cover-up allegations. Nobody knows what happened that night. There has been circumstantial evidence provided against Karen Reed, and there has been circumstantial evidence provided in the third-party culpability defense. It will ultimately be up to a jury to decide. But as of right now, all parties are presumed innocent. So, with that disclaimer, let's jump in and take a look. At 2.22 a.m., almost an hour after Brian Higgins says that he left the Alberts' home to go to Canton Police Department to do administrative work, a call is placed from Brian Alberts' phone to Brian Higgins. 17 seconds later, Higgins calls Brian Albert back, and the phone call lasts 22 seconds. Here is attorney David Yanetti discussing these calls during a pretrial hearing on March 20th. Brian Higgins did testify before the federal grand jury. And at that time, he was specifically asked if on January 29th of 2022, he made any phone calls when he got home. He said that he did not. He testified that he lived alone. 
He testified that he was alone that night. He testified there was nobody else in his bedroom. He testified that when he went to bed, he placed his phone on the bedside table. After making those admissions, he was confronted by a federal prosecutor with his phone records. Those records revealed that Brian Albert called Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning on January 29. Those records reveal, moreover, that 17 seconds later, Brian Higgins called Brian Albert back, and that call lasted for 22 seconds. Now, when he was first confronted, Brian Higgins first tried to claim that it had to have been a butt dial. Um, that term butt dial is used by many of the Commonwealth's witnesses to explain the many calls between them and among them. And I, I've never seen a case where there have been so many butt dials, to be frank. Uh, but Mr. Higgins was already locked in. He already testified his phone was on the bedside table. His butt was in the bed, the phone was in the table. The, the, the two could not have met, Your Honor. There was no possibility of a butt dial. And then Higgins admitted that. And that wasn't Mr. Higgins leaving Brian Albert a voicemail. He also admitted under oath that the toll records would have reflected a voicemail if they went to voicemail. He admitted that to call Brian Albert back, he would have had to first reach for his phone, then unlock it with the passcode or face ID. Then he would have to press on Brian Albert's number. And that is exactly what he did. And he testified that that was what he did. Yanetti goes on to say that Higgins testified that nobody from the Commonwealth ever asked him about that phone call. And Trooper Proctor, the lead investigator, never asked him about that call either. So what about Brian Albert? Now, for his part, Brian Albert also first tried to claim that his phone call to Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning was a butt dial. He said that he was awake and watching TV, but he was called back to the grand jury to testify a second time. The second time, Brian Albert changed his testimony to say that at 2.22 in the morning, he and his wife were in bed in an intimate situation. He claimed that he had his phone with him in the bed. So now he's claiming that it was during that intimate situation with his wife that he supposedly butt dialed Brian Higgins. He had no explanation, however, for how his phone picked up when Higgins called him back 17 seconds later. He had no explanation for the 22 second phone conversation that followed. And it's worth noting that Higgins testified he never heard any intimate noises on the other end of the line either. Brian Albert tried to maintain that he butt dialed Higgins. But again, that would mean that his butt also answered the phone when Higgins called back and it doesn't make any sense. Both men denied talking to each other despite being confronted with that mountain of evidence by federal prosecutors. I've mentioned before that one of the issues with so many conflicting statements in this case is that we don't know if they are inaccurate and conflicting because of the witnesses or because of the investigators, or both, since none of the interviews were recorded. The witnesses changing their stories during a federal grand jury questioning, though, well, that's a little different. Around the same time that Brian Higgins and Brian Albert have this exchange, Jen McCabe has arrived home. And based on her phone extraction and her Apple Watch data, we're able to kind of get an idea of what she was doing around this time. Now, the defense has said before that when Jen arrived home, she seemed like she was pacing according to her watch information. I took a look at this. The health data isn't easy to digest because it's written in a way where the report is basically row after row of numbers entered into multiple columns that measure and record different things. It's a lot. So I mapped it out and I did some averages to give us a better idea if this really is consistent with pacing. After the first seven and a half minutes that Jen was home, she averaged around 33.33 steps per minute. Now to give reference, when exercising, a brisk pace of walking is considered to be about 100 steps per minute on average. So Jen averaged about a third of that it's definitely enough to be considered pacing, though these steps also include when she arrived home, and we don't know where all she walked in the house those first seven or eight minutes, so it's kind of hard to tell. 
The next eight and a half minutes, starting at 2.23, there are only 19 steps recorded. Now during this time, there is some other activity on Jen's phone as well. At 2.23, she unlocks her phone. She sends a text at 2.25 and then another about 45 seconds later. 2.26, she deletes two screenshots. And then at 2.27 a.m. and 40 seconds, the search that has divided a community. How long to die in the cold? In episode four, I played some clips from a hearing where Judge Canone hears both sides argue a motion to quash subpoenas. During this hearing, both sides give their argument on the 2.27 a.m. search based on their experts. In that moment, the explanation from the defense was presented so clearly. Apple Cocoa timestamps are specific down to the microsecond, and it's irrefutable. The Commonwealth maintained that it just showed up at 2.27 a.m. on the report, but it was really 6.24 a.m., but the one at 6.23 a.m. showed up fine. It's just the one after that at 6.24 a.m. that didn't. That explanation didn't make sense to me. So after hearing both sides present their case, I said I no longer had any doubts about that timestamp. It seems logical to accept the explanation that is clear, scientific, even mathematical, but not everyone agrees. I've mentioned before that most people following this case have picked a very clear side. Some accept the theory of the Commonwealth. Their side believes that justice for John O'Keefe means Karen being convicted. Some believe the theory of the defense. Their side believes justice for John O'Keefe means exonerating Karen Reed, finding out what really happened to John, and holding those responsible accountable. Both sides desperately want justice. They just don't agree with what that justice entails. The passion behind that desire for justice can sometimes prevent us from seeing or accepting something from the other side. So I wanted an outside opinion. I wanted to hear the timestamp explanation directly from someone who doesn't have a side based on pure fact. I'm not sure how many hours I actually spent researching this, but I can tell you that it was a lot. I talked to a programmer and I asked him, explain this to me like I'm five years old. Then I kind of stared like it was crazy and said, maybe we should try to explain it like I'm two years old. This was a lot for me to try to grasp since I'm not a very techie person. Once I was finally able to grasp the concept, I verified and corroborated the information with an internet security and data recovery specialist, a former Celebrite employee, and an Apple iOS software programmer. I did a 20 minute video getting into the specifics, but it's all extremely technical. So if you're interested to see it, it is available on my channel. It's youtube.com slash at Brandy Churchwell. But For this episode, I'm going to give a CliffsNotes version that's a little less techy, but still really important. First of all, I have to say that I follow and watch and cover a lot of trials. I have seen more Celebrite experts testify than I could possibly count. I love getting the data from these reports, but I have to admit that until having to research this, I didn't fully understand how it works. I always just thought that Celebrite pulls everything and the Celebrite experts know everything. The end. That's just how it is. But that's not actually how it works. Apple is known for being at the forefront of protecting their users' safety and privacy, so much so that they steadfastly refused for years to give in to FBI demands to create back doors into their phones. Their software developers began enhancing their security so much that it became impossible for the FBI to access iPhone data. So along comes Celebrite. It's a firm that was able to basically hack into iPhones and access the data that the FBI couldn't. Celebrite and Apple have been playing a cat and mouse game ever since. That part is something that I didn't know and it's really important on understanding all of this. Celebrite is able to provide forensic analysis and imaging for iPhones where access has been granted by the user. This involves basically a big dumping out of the entire file system contents and then going from there. So that brings us to the embedded database system used for iPhone called SQLite. 
written out as S-Q-L-I-T-E. SQLite is the reason that we know that this timestamp is irrefutable, even without seeing the full extracted data. SQLite is used in every iPhone, Android, smart TV, smartwatch, router, you name it. It's installed on tens of billions of devices worldwide. The SQLite database uses what's called wall files, W-A-L. A wall file is basically a temporary file that holds information until it can be added to the main database. Think of Google Sheets. If you click on a cell, it highlights it with that blue box around it while you type in whatever it is that you want to type. You can see everything in the highlighted cell because it's holding it all for you right there until you're done and then you hit the enter button, at which point the contents of that cell are added to the sheet. There are what they call checkpoints where the data on this temporary wall file is entered onto the main DB file and the wall file is deleted automatically. These checkpoints can be triggered by certain things. In the Google Sheets analogy, it would be triggered by hitting the enter button. On different versions of iOS, different actions can trigger the checkpoints, like closing out a tab, for example. So the 2.27 a.m. search was recovered from one of these temporary wall files that had been automatically deleted. But here's how we know that the search labeled 2.27 a.m. was not the same or related to the search at 6.24 a.m., and it's not the same as the basketball search. The iPhone would have inserted activity of both of the tabs that she was on and the tab that she was switching to, and the switch would have differed by a very minute amount, like microseconds. This part was mentioned in the hearing when talking about the Apple Cocoa timestamps. So we know that it's not related to those two things. So how do we know that it actually really was done at 2.27 a.m.? The checkpoints that I mentioned can be triggered by certain actions depending on the iOS system, but what's more important is that it is written in the code that checkpoints are done automatically by default when files reach a certain size or, more importantly, if it's been more than five minutes since the last checkpoint. That means that there is no possible way for the search to have been done at any other time other than between 2.22 a.m. and 2.27 a.m. It is irrefutable because it is written in the coding. The sequence of events is just how the database works and there's no way to make it work otherwise. In the last two pretrial hearings, both David Yanetti and Alan Jackson both said that the federal investigators, who are completely independent of both the Commonwealth and the defense, also verified that the search happened at 2.27 a.m. ADA Lally had a strange way of addressing this because he said that his Celebrite expert, Ian Whiffen, would testify that the searches happened at 6.23 and 6.24 a.m., which nobody disputes, but he didn't mention the 227 search or say that Whiffen would testify that it didn't happen. I thought that this was an interesting choice of words. When I released the video this week of the technical explanation that I received from the programmer, most of the feedback and conversation that it sparked was great and really positive. So to my sources who spent so much time with me and didn't even block me after I kept coming back asking more questions, thank you so much. Your time and patience was greatly appreciated. I did notice, however, that there is a group who have already decided that Karen is guilty, no matter what, and this search didn't happen, no matter how many programmers or coders say that it did. The main argument for this that they believe the Cellbrite expert will say something different, and the Cellbrite expert that the Commonwealth is bringing in now is the one who would know. Again, I thought Cellbrite experts were the ones who knew everything too. I learned through this research that the super smart Cellbrite experts don't just create a program that grabs information and bam, you have a report that you can read. They create a program that dumps everything out and then they have to do testing to reverse engineer the iOS portion of the source code since they don't have access to it. 
This is the only way that they can determine how Apple lays out the data, how and when it's updated, things like that. They also have to reverse engineer the direct file system access so that they can understand the file system itself and how it stores data. This is apparently the hard part. A programmer who watched the video gave this great example in comments when trying to explain it to someone else. Let's say that you're Celebrite. You created this really impressive and fancy robot that can go to the mailbox and retrieve all of your mail for you. But in your mail is a letter from your grandmother who was a spy in World War II and she's really paranoid so she writes all of her letters in a secret code. You have a key that tells you some of the code but you have to work with the rest until all of the words make sense. Celebrite experts get the mail, aka the data. The key that tells you some of grandma's code is SQLite. It's the same code for everyone, which is how we know that the five minute checkpoints happen. The parts that you don't know in granny's code are the iOS and direct file system access. But look, don't take my word for it. I recommend talking to programmers and Celebrite employees and asking them your questions. We don't have to just accept what the defense or the prosecution tell us. We can always research it ourselves. So I always recommend to do that. Up to this point, the majority of my focus on the issues in this case have been directed at the investigation and the investigators. I said in episode one that the Google search is the first piece of evidence that really drew me into this. Everything else could be explained away if you look at it in pieces. The contradictory statements could be because of the investigators not recording interviews or even taking notes and not writing summaries about the interviews until weeks later. The ever-changing guest list of who was there, that could be due to investigators also because if they didn't get it right, then it wouldn't be right in the reports. I also thought the injuries don't seem to line up with being hit by a car, but I'm not a doctor. I grew up in a body shop and I did paint and body work for years, so looking at the damage to the car, that didn't add up to hitting somebody, but I saw that she also backed into John's car, so maybe that's how the taillight cracked. But with everything else, I've been able to see a different explanation. But I can't, as much as I try, figure out why that search would be done at this time. And just like that, reasonable doubt appeared. Not long after this search, Jen McCabe's phone locks and there are no steps recorded for an hour and 17 minutes. Another big moment that plays a crucial role in the defense's case is happening around the same time. During a hearing on September 15th, 2023, attorney David Yanetti tells the court that on February 2nd, after Karen was arraigned, he received a call from a friend and colleague of Brian Alberts, naming Brian and his nephew Colin as potential suspects in John's death. Yanetti says that this tip on day one is what led them to begin their own investigation, which is what brought them to Lucky, the snowplow driver. Here is David Yanetti. That tip on day one of this case led us to do the investigation the Commonwealth did not do, the investigation they refused to do. And uh, as my co-counsel has argued today, that investigation revealed that the Commonwealth's investigation was based on one lie after another. And the exposure of those lies is a major change circumstance which justifies lowering my client's bail to personal recognizance. I'd like the court to consider that at the outset of this case, State Trooper Michael Proctor submitted a report stating that Fairview Road in Canton had not been plowed during the early morning hours of January 29th, 2022. He claimed in that report that Michael Trotta at the DPW had told him during a phone call uh, that he had with him uh, after John O'Keefe was killed. We did not take Michael Proctor's word for that, and thank God we didn't, because we learned that was a lie. Rather than take Michael Proctor's word, we instead said our investigator to speak to Mr. Trotta in February of 2022. He directed us to another man who led us to the plow driver who did plow the street. Our investigator interviewed plow driver Brian Laughlin, Within a couple of weeks of John O'Keefe's death, 
Mr. Loughran told us what he has now told Michael Proctor, now that Proctor finally got around to speaking to him a year and a half after the fact. Shortly after John O'Keefe died, Brian Loughran told us that he did plow the street in front of 34 Fairview, made a pass by there at 2.30 in the morning on January 29th, and when he passed that house, there was not a lot of snow that had fallen. Visibility was good. The lights were working on his plow. He passed right by the area where John O'Keefe's body would have been if Karen Reed had actually struck him with her vehicle. And he confirmed that at 2.30 a.m., plowing that area, there was no body there. And Mr. Loughran was firm with Trooper Proctor. There was no body. And he told him not only was there no body, but if there had been a body there, he would have seen it. He left Michael Proctor in the Commonwealth no wiggle room. The plow driver's testimony should end this case. To put it simply, no body at 2.30 a.m. means Karen Reed is innocent. Forget about all the other evidence that points to her innocence, but this one fact alone prevents the Commonwealth from ever convicting her. No body at 2.30 a.m. She is innocent. But, Your Honor, it's not just that he saw no body at 2.30 a.m. After that, he saw a Ford Edge parked right in the area where John O'Keefe's body was later found. Whoever moved that Ford Edge to that location in the early morning hours of January 29th, hours after Karen Lee Reed left Fairview to go home, that person or persons knows or knows, know or knows exactly what happened to John O'Keefe. That mysterious driver and his or her accomplices likely know who beat up and killed John O'Keefe, and that person knows how John O'Keefe received all of the scratch marks and bite marks to his arm. This is all brand new information to you, Your Honor, as you did not have the benefit of any of this exculpatory evidence when you were deciding on an appropriate amount of bail. Assistant D.A. Lally responds. Now, as far as um, what well, counsel states as, as Mr. Loughran's uh, testimony goes into uh, a great detail uh, in the motion as well. Uh, what he leaves out, though, is that all these insinuations uh, that the Ford Edge somehow belongs to the Alberts or is Brian Alberts uh, Ford Edge or something to that effect. What he leaves out uh, from that interview with Mr. Loughran is that Mr. Loughran specifically says uh, that that Ford Edge is not Brian Alberts Ford Edge. Uh, another sort of interesting issue in relation to the affidavit from the investigator in regard to seeing that Ford Edge uh, and his label as such is that the investigator essentially takes Mr. Loughran out to the parking lot, points to a Ford Edge, and essentially says, is that it? Uh, somewhat suggestive uh, identification of, of that particular vehicle, uh, the Commonwealth would, uh, would suggest. Now, we need to note that what he says here is a misrepresentation of what the affidavit says. It actually says that Lucky described it as a small SUV parked exactly where the body was found. The affidavit says that he described the SUV as, quote, a Ford Edge or something similar, end quote. It goes on to say that they then walked outside to the parking lot to see if there were any vehicles that looked similar to the one that Lucky saw that morning. The affidavit says, quote, he immediately pointed to a Ford Edge in the parking lot and said, it looked like that, end quote. Lucky did, however, say that it was not Brian Albert's Ford Edge. In response to that, one more time, here's Yanetti. With regard to the Ford Edge that Brian Laughlin saw outside that property, I would say two things. Number one, uh, assume it was not Brian Albert's uh, uh, Ford Edge. It doesn't matter because there was somebody there outside the property where the body was found after 2.30 a.m. They would have either seen or not seen a body and known or not known that there was a body there. But finally, with regard to that point, Mr. Loughran was clear that it was not Brian Albert's Ford Edge. What he did not uh, tell you, what Mr. Lally did not tell you is there's another member of the Albert family that has a Ford Edge, and that's Colin Albert. Okay. Okay. 
This was a first for me. I can't recall having ever seen applause erupt in a courtroom, especially during a pretrial hearing. This is an emotional situation for all parties involved. The O'Keefe's have suffered immense tragedy, losing John's sister, and then her husband, and then John. They have been unfairly attacked during a time when they are having to show up for these hearings, listen to what's being presented, deal with the media and the crowds, all while still mourning their loss. During this hearing, and during the applause, I can see the faces of Karen's family sitting in the courtroom. It's clear that they truly believe in her innocence, as do so many of her supporters. And what if the defense is right? A weak or sloppy investigation can make anything look questionable, but the defense is shifting. It's not about poking holes to get reasonable doubt. They're providing an alternate theory that is actually backed now by a major witness statement and cell phone forensics. They're laying out their case and telling the court that an innocent woman is fighting for her life. And then there's the Alberts and McCabe's. This has completely flipped their lives upside down. Could they really be sticking together to protect one of their own? Or are they innocent witnesses and the conspiracy is actually to blame them for covering up a murder when it's really a hit and run? I've said since the first episode to keep an open mind about both sides because one thing that we've learned about this case is that nothing is what it seems. I'm Brandi Churchwell, 13th Jura Podcast, and I'll see y'all next week.